Hey, hey, hey. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, oh. Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nightmare commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the smart speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. On Mark Dolan tonight, we're live an hour later on Sundays from 10. And in my take at 10, why the woke left don't realise that by supporting Hamas terror, they are turkeys voting for Christmas. What would Margaret Thatcher be advising Rishi Sunak to do to win the next election? I'll be asking her former top advisor, Niall Gardner. Plus Anne Whittacombe, the pundit, tomorrow's papers. And more reaction to the shock passing of friend star Matthew Perry. We're live from 10. Let's get to work. It's 10 o'clock on TV, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my take at 10, why the woke left don't realise that by supporting Hamas terror, they are the turkeys voting for Christmas. As our national broadcaster is mocked worldwide for its handling of the Israel crisis, has the BBC become a global laughing stock? And as next week's King's Speech sees a bonfire of eco-policies, could ditching net zero save Rishi Sunak's premiership? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker, former government minister, politics legend Anne Widdicombe. Plus, what would Margaret Thatcher be advising Rishi Sunak to do to win the next election? I'll be asking her former top advisor, Niall Gardner. And tomorrow's newspaper front pages and reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits. So, a packed show, lots to get through. My take at 10 is on the way. I'll be dealing with the woke left, and I'm not pulling my punches. First, the headlines and Aaron Armstrong.
Very good evening to you. It's Aaron Armstrong here in the GB newsroom. Israel claimed to have killed dozens of militants in direct clashes with Hamas in northern Gaza. The Israeli military says the Hamas fighters were killed leaving a tunnel near the Erez crossing, which previously linked Gaza to Israel. The IDF says it's been massively bombarding Gaza from the air to ensure the safety of its forces on the ground and to eliminate, in its words, terrorist infrastructure. Its spokesperson, Daniel Hagari, once again urged residents to move south for their own safety. Over the last two weeks, we have been calling on residents of the northern Gaza Strip and Gaza City to relocate southward temporarily. Relocating southward is for their personal safety. We are today emphasizing that this is an urgent call. Among the hostages are foreign workers, not a small number of them, for whom the process of identification and reaching families is complicated for us. It is taking us time to build up this picture. Well, the UN's warning that civil order in Gaza is beginning to collapse after thousands of people broke into aid depots in a desperate search for basic supplies. UNRWA, the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees, says it's an indication people in Gaza have reached breaking point. Uh, residents have endured uh, Israeli bombardment. Some communications, though, have now been restored after a total blackout. Uh, the Palestinian Red Crescent says Israel's told them to immediately evacuate the Al Quds Hospital, which has around 400 patients and some 14,000 people taking refuge there. The health ministry there uh, says just over 8,000 people have been killed since the beginning of the war. It's unlikely any Labour MPs will be sacked due to disagreements with the party's position on Israel. That's according to the Shadow Science Secretary. Peter Kyle says the party's leadership will probably continue engaging with frontbenchers, despite disagreements with Sir Keir Starmer. He's echoed the UN's call for a humanitarian pause in fighting and for aid to be allowed into Gaza. But many senior figures want him to go further and back a full ceasefire. Matthew Perry's family have said they're heartbroken following the loss of their son at the age of 54. Forget hypnosis. The way to quit smoking is you have to dance naked in a field of heather and then bathe in the sweat of six healthy young men. <laughs> or what my father calls Thursday night. The Hollywood actor star of the sitcom Friends was found by police at his home in an apparent drowning. He became a household name as Chandler Bing alongside his five central co-stars in the iconic 1990 show. In a statement, his family said, Matthew brought so much joy to the world as an actor and a friend. You all meant so much to him, they said, and we appreciate the tremendous outpouring of love. And Matthew Perry had been open in the past about his struggles with painkillers and alcohol addiction. Well, that's it for the moment. I'll be back with more news a little later. Now, it's over to Mark. Rest in peace, Matthew Perry, a giant of television comedy. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. As our national broadcaster is mocked worldwide for handling the Israel crisis in such an egregious manner, has the BBC become a global laughing stock? as next week's King's Speech sees a bonfire of eco-policies. Could ditching net zero save Rishi Sunak's premiership? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker, former government minister, politics legend Anne Widdicombe. Plus tomorrow's newspaper front pages and reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits. Ringside this evening, politics consultant Emma Burnell, journalist Linda Jubilee and social worker and broadcaster Yosef David. What would Margaret Thatcher be advising Rishi Sunak to do to win the next election? I'll be asking her former top advisor, Niall Gardner, live in the studio in a brand new Sunday segment called The Last Word. And today is National Cat Day. So send me pictures of your pussy. Mark at GBNews.com. Here is producer Maria's uh, lovely cats, her babies Nancy and Winston, watching GB News. They've got great taste. And here's my little kitty, Harry. So we'll be showing yours after every break tonight, so keep them coming. Your cat pictures, mark at gbnews.com. A packed hour, those papers are coming, but first, my take at 10. Any crisis reveals someone's true character. We saw it during the pandemic, those who backed common sense, individual liberty and evidence-based science versus dogma, ideology and ultimately tyranny. 
And in just three weeks since the horrific terror attack on Israel, the death of over 1,400 people, including 260 at a music festival, so the woke left, the be kind crowd, who are much better humans than you and me, have shown their true colours, attending marches and, by implication, cheering on the murder, rape and torture of innocent civilians. A band of psychopaths, our national broadcaster, can't even bring themselves to call terrorists, even though they have only one goal. Hamas want genocide. This is rebadged Nazism, to which the liberal progressives have either turned a blind eye or effectively supported. The Be Kind militia call everyone that they don't like Nazis, except actual Nazis. And now, with a twisted and heartless response to the human horrors of October the 7th, they've revealed their true nature. The mask has slipped. This is the moment that wokeism jumped the shark and truly lost the plot. The historian Niall Ferguson points out in today's Mail newspaper that the response progressives have made to the kidnapping of Holocaust survivors, the burning alive of bodies, the gouging out of eyes, the rape of women, the parading of corpses on the back of pickup trucks and the beheading of babies has dramatically increased awareness of this toxic brand of leftism. With its de facto support for these medieval murderers in the Middle East, wokeism has both revealed itself and overplayed its hand. Now, it may well be true that Israel has a case to answer for its treatment of Palestinian people, and a two-state solution in which Israelis and Palestinians can live in harmony must be the Holy Grail. But calling for a ceasefire is another chilling manoeuvre from those caring sharing types, because it demonstrates a total ignorance of the history and politics of the Middle East, and a total lack of empathy for the existential threat that Jews and Israel now face. Hamas don't have a strategic goal in the region. They don't want a two-state solution. They want a no-state solution. They want to wipe all Jews off the planet. And what these idiots marching in Western cities don't realise is that the people who hate Jews and hate Israel hate us too. So Israel's war is our war. If Hamas and their ilk cannot be eliminated, we will be next in line for their murder spree. Take those queers for Palestine. Have you ever seen anything more ridiculous in your life? If Hamas got hold of these gay and trans people, they would be eliminated faster than you can say vegan sausage roll. This talk of ceasefire is a total red herring and up there with the appeasement of Hitler in the 1930s. Nazism had to be defeated and so does this. A ceasefire is effectively asking Israel to be a sitting duck to more terror. A ceasefire is snake oil language. It's doublespeak for Israel, suck it up. Now, I have a bit of sympathy for Keir Starmer, who believes in Israel's right to self-defence, whilst many in his party do not. Starmer is between a rocket and a hard place. But what's clear is that the thousands of people in Britain marching on the streets every weekend, some of whom are calling for a holy war, is a direct assault on the values of this country, of democracy, of the rule of law, of tolerance and of decency. Those woke idiots don't realise that by cheering it on, they'll be next. They are turkeys voting for Christmas and eventually they'll get stuffed. Now, let's get the views of my top pundits this evening, political consultant and playwright Emma Burnell, journalist and broadcaster Linda Jubilee, and social worker and political commentator Yosef David. Yosef, can I start with you? Uh, your reaction to the woke left's response to the attacks on the 7th of October? Well, at risk of being accused of trying to ingratiate myself with the host, I have to say that I thought your monologue was fantastic and I agreed with everything you said. Um, the woke left have a lot to answer for with regard to the events in this country over the past two weeks. They position themselves and present themselves as people who advocate for minority groups, but they've been unable to stand with the Jewish community, even though they know that uh, fear, depression, trauma is widespread. 
And we have to say that these people who are presenting themselves as trying to advocate for minority communities have managed to ignore the Jewish community. And we can look at the self-righteousness in which the people who have pulled down posters of kidnapped Israeli children have acted. They actually believe they are on the right side of history. It can definitely be said that woke ideology has led to an increase in anti-Semitism. Far from treating Jews like the vulnerable minority they are, in actual fact, organizations like BLM have termed the, the Jews as a powerful group who gag the media. Emma Burnell, your reaction to what your colleagues on the left, some of your friends, uh, have done in response to what happened earlier this month? Well, I'm a bit old to be friends with the people who are um, on college campuses. Look, I think... The key thing is to differentiate between those who have genuine empathy and sympathy for the Palestinian people as well as the Israeli people, both of whose sides are, are suffering terrible trauma, pain and loss. And we should never forget that that is true on both sides. And those idiots who are just being what is essentially a useful idiot for a terrorist group, which is Hamas. Mm. Um, and I think that the majority of people who might be um, tempted to go on a demonstration of calling for peace are probably in the first category, but that they're too easily kind of, you know, lumped in together with the, with the useful idiots. So I think there are problems with calling for a ceasefire because, frankly, Hamas are not going to offer one. Mm -hmm. um, ceasefires have to be in agreement by both sides. Um, but I do think that um, calling for humanitarian pause, ca calling for aid to be able to get into the innocent people, uh, innocent civilians of Palestine, is essential. And it will be essential for the humanity of the Israeli people fighting the war, that they can feel that they have done so in a just way. Um, ultimately, and I'm, I think we all agree on this, the end goal has to be peace, mm. the end goal has mm. to be a two-state solution. How we get there from here, that's a long, hard road. But it has to start with seeing how we can maintain all of our humanity and our empathy for everyone who's suffering. Indeed. Uh, Linda, these people have been going on pro-Palestinian marches at which people have been calling for a complete jihad, a holy war, the destruction of Jews. And, of course, there's been no condemnation from these same people about what happened on the 7th of October. I don't need to remind everyone watching and listening that babies have been beheaded, women raped, dead bodies paraded on the back of pickup trucks. Uh, the woke left have failed to condemn these actions. So is this the moment that wokeism jumped the shark and lost the plot? Um, I don't think it will be the moment, actually. I mean, it is a moment. Uh, I think what's happening here is that you've got some very, very big demonstrations. Within those big demonstrations, I'm told by security experts that I've spoken to this week, there are really, really troublesome elements. Mm. And that's the problem, because they have the, the, their toxic outlook kind of infects other people. Yeah. You know, a lot of the people on those protest marches, it's not that they're, you know, desperately woke. Many, many of those people have watched those images on television um, on both sides of this terrible conflict, and they are extremely upset. The problem is that they can be pushed and persuaded and used, and that's a very, very difficult thing. Now, Emma's quite right in, in thinking that maybe we should call for a humanitarian pause, but the trouble is these are only words. A, a pause to allow aid in... Mm -hmm. is, in effect, a ceasefire. And the problem is here that we are in a military conflict. And the problem, therefore, is that at this stage, before any objective has actually been achieved by Israel, it's very difficult in military terms to have a ceasefire. That's the conundrum that faces people. OK, well, listen, folks, uh, we've got lots more to come, including tomorrow's papers, when this story will doubtless reappear. But next up, has the BBC become a global laughing stock? And is Rishi Sunak right to double down on anti-green policies? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker, former government minister Anne Widdicombe is next. Who is it? We're here for the show. More energy this time! 
Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to the show. The paper's at 10.30 sharp, but it is National Cat Day, so you've been sending pictures of your pussies to mark at gbnews.com. Quite revealing, I can't lie. I'll be saving some of them onto the hard drive of my computer. Uh, Sharon's lovely cat is called Boris. Nearly as handsome as the actual Boris. Uh, gorgeous, gorgeous cat. Congratulations, Sharon. How about Jennifer's kitty, Pippa? Having a little sleep there in a gorgeous position. Lovely charcoal colour. You've got gorgeous cats. More of your cats to come, but it's time now for the newsmaker. And following its fortnight-long refusal to describe Hamas as terrorists, even though they entered Israel on the 7th of October and claimed over 1,400 lives, and after wrongly pointing the finger at Israel for the bombing of a hospital in Gaza, which led, led to 300 deaths, has the BBC become the laughing stock of the world? Well, they certainly are in Israel, where some of their top comedy stars have released a sketch mocking our national broadcaster. It's hilarious. Take a listen. Good evening from London. Here are some news from the war in Gaza. Israel has bombed a hospital, killing hundreds of innocent people. More, more. Much better. With more details, our Middle East correspondent, Harry Whitegilt. Good evening, Rachel, from the illegal colony of Tel Aviv. Israeli officials has denied bombing the hospital, but we have video footage showing what really happened indeed. Absolutely shocking, Harry. So, are the BBC a laughing stock? I thought that was a brilliant sketch. But uh, let's get the views now of tonight's newsmaker, former government minister and television personality Anne Widdicombe. And the BBC have become the story, haven't they? And they're being laughed at. This is a problem. 
Uh, they are. I mean, nobody takes them seriously, or very few people take them seriously. Uh, and whereas they used to have a voice that, that was real authority, and if you wanted the facts, you listened to the BBC and you, you know, the days of the great broadcasters like Richard Dimbleby, Robin Day, you believed what was being said. Mm. Um, but the BBC is, over many years, there's nothing new about this and it's not been peculiar to, to any government. Uh, over the years, the BBC uh, has become gradually more and more left-wing. If you look at its reporting during COVID, you know, there was the government line very clearly printed saying you know, that not all these deaths were due to COVID. It was simply people who had tested positive within 28 days or whatever the period was. Uh, and the BBC used to say, in terms, these people had died of COVID. Now, that is straightforward misreporting, and it's the B. Uh, and they do that all the time in numerous ways, but to have actually refused to call Hamas a terrorist organisation, treating it as if it's a country, uh, and it really mustn't take sides against terrorism, that, I think, will have convinced a lot of people uh, that the BBC has just thoroughly lost its way. And, well, it, you know, I mean, yeah. all, the, all the pressure is for a ceasefire. Israel cannot have a ceasefire. Israel is fighting a war which it's got to win. And, you know, letting Hamas simply regroup and, you know, and regather um, by giving a ceasefire is a piece of lunacy. They've got to win this war. Now, Anne, as a former Home Office minister, prisons minister, you've doubtless sat in on Cobra-style meetings. The BBC wrongly pointed the finger at Israel for the bombing of a Gaza hospital. Tragically, 300 deaths. Now, the Beeb corrected their position days later, but the damage was done, a propaganda coup for Hamas. Yes, they, they, they just went in where angels fear to tread and said, you know, this is the answer and this is what happened. And then, of course, you know, when there's a cooler analysis and a proper examination of the evidence, uh, it transpires that's not what happened at all. Well, why couldn't they wait? Is it just the pressure of having to be melodramatic and, you know, get melodramatic news out immediately? Or is it simply that they've lost altogether the perspective of proper, impartial, careful, analytical reporting, if they know the meaning of any of those words? Well, Anne, you said the word impartial. Is it an anti-Israel bias at the Beeb? I think that is pretty evident. Well, the Beeb would deny it. Uh, but I think in the way that they have approached uh, the nomenclature of Hamas, uh, then not calling it terrorism, uh, the way that uh, they have reported Israeli activity as if it is a fact and then it's later shown not to be, all the emphasis hugely on the civilian casualties in Gaza. I mean, never mind what's going on in Israel. Uh, I, yeah, I, I would say they haven't been impartial on this. I would say it's something that Ofcom actually ought to look at. Uh, the BBC broadcast hundreds of hours of radio and television a week. Uh, they have argued that when it comes to calling Hamas terrorists, they've stressed the importance of not taking sides and have argued that they have followed journalistic protocol. And regarding the hospital tragedy in Gaza, uh, they've identified their mistake. And, of course, all journalists do make mistakes. Um, and let's talk about the Prime Minister now, if we can. The Observer are reporting that Rishi Sunak will use next week's King's Speech to advance the expansion of North Sea oil and gas exploration, as well as pro-car policies, in the hope of opening up a clear divide over the green agenda with Labour. Is it the right thing to do, and will it work? Oh, oh I mean, I assume that the Conservative Party has actually been watching and listening to Reform UK and has seen the popularity of some of its measures. Uh, and it began with Ulas, of course, uh, and now they're looking beyond that. I mean, people will put up with anything as long as it's government spending because they think that's somehow nothing to do with them. Mm. When they have to spend money on boilers and on new cars and all the rest of it, uh, when they have to do that and it actually hits home, then they're much less keen on all this theory. And theory is what it is. There is no, uh, absolutely no evidence whatever that if we don't do something by 2035, it will be too late. There is no evidence of that.
Uh, so could this policy, this slight reversal on net zero, deliver dividends for Rishi Sunak in a year's time? Could it move the dial for him politically? I think it could. I think people will find it a bit cynical because he's always sung the merits of net zero. Uh, I think they'll find it a bit cynical, but given that Keir Starmer is sticking with uh, the net zero targets and is sticking with all the policies which will impact so heavily on ordinary citizens and particularly on citizens who aren't that well off, uh, I think, yes, it could open up uh, some ground. Perhaps he'd now like to listen to Reform UK on a few other things as well and open up a bit more ground. More importantly, listen to Anne Widdicombe. Pearls of Wisdom every Sunday night at 10.15. Anne, we'll catch you in a week's time. Thank you so much for joining us. Coming up tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from my top pundits and a brand new segment, The Last Word, tonight with former Margaret Thatcher advisor Niall Gardner live in the studio. What would Thatcher be advising Rishi Sunak? That's next. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. The show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. Join me, Mark Dolan, Fridays and Saturdays from 9, Sundays from 10. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? It's your new teeth. It's your new teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Welcome back to the show. It is National Cat Day, so you've been sending pictures of your kitties. Uh, these are Jacqueline's kitties. They are siblings, Hugo and Heidi. What fine thoroughbreds they look like. And Mel's 18-year-old rescue, Nanu. Another fabulous one. And how about Sheena's lovely girl, Poppy, who's watching Mark Nolan tonight? And her fur, a lot more orderly than mine. Thank you for those brilliant pictures. We've got more at 10.45. Uh, we've been conducting an exclusive Mark Dolan tonight People's Poll. I've been asking, has the BBC become a global laughing stock? The results are in. 
And I'm afraid to say that more than 75% say yes and fewer than 24% say no. OK, folks, well, lots to get through. Niall Gardner, Margaret Thatcher's former advisor, live in the studio in just a few minutes' time. What would the Iron Lady be advising our current Prime Minister? But first, this. And we start with the Times newspaper. UN warning on Gaza as desperation takes hold. Conflict has accelerated terror threat to Britain, is the other headline. The Sun newspaper next. Matthew Perry dead at 54. Friend to the end. Star found in his hot tub. A-list pals heartbroken. Daily Express now. We've lost a friend. Heartbroken stars pay tribute to Matthew Perry after death at 54 in a hot tub. And as humanitarian crisis in Gaza grows more desperate, Iran warns that the war may spread. Middle East on precipice. Three and easy. City SWAT united away in the United uh, Manchester, I should say, the Manchester derby. A big, strong victory there for Man City. Also, UN says civil order in Gaza is starting to break down. Matthew Perry, 1969 to 2023, metrosexual, ironic actor who captured the spirit of an age. Uh, Daily Star now, and they lead with, Rover knows when you'll get home because dogs can tell the time by smell. Whiff, whiff, woof. I make it time for a treat, says the dog on the front, uh, front page of the Star. The mystery of why dogs are always waiting for us when we get home has been solved. They can actually smell the time. And I can smell the time too. It's coming up to 23 minutes past 11. Let's have a look at the Metro. Uh, Matthew Perry. We've lost a great friend, uh, of course, a wonderful actor, comedy actor, one of the great stars of Friends, and uh, may he rest in peace. Financial Times, Israeli forces gradually expanding Gaza ground assault against Hamas. OK, folks, let's get a reaction to those headlines from my top pundits ringside tonight. Political consultant Emma Burnell, journalist Linda Jubilee and political commentator and social worker Yosef David. Uh, lots to sink our teeth into. Uh, but UN warning, Linda, on Gaza as desperation takes hold. Uh, things are getting worse. Uh, I've heard figures of 7,000 uh, Palestinians yeah, uh, who have lost eight. their lives. Uh, yeah. Is it approaching eight now? Uh, the death toll grows. Um, and, and a crisis that could, could spread beyond the Middle East. Absolutely. I mean, we're thinking mainly about Iran here. But just to go back to what's happening with, with some, some food that gets in, of course, people are so desperate now that they've started raiding the depots. I mean, at that point, you're really looking at civil disorder. You're mm. looking at the breakdown of all society. And I think we're right on the edge of that happening. I think we'll see even more tomorrow. Well, indeed. Now, this uh, act of self-defence by Israel, Yosef, is creating a humanitarian crisis and it's causing civilian casualties, civilian deaths. Of course, that is Hamas's strategy, is it not? This is exactly what Hamas wants. And I would say that if uh, civil law is breaking down, it's probably the case that Hamas have gone underground. Mm. Uh, there isn't anyone there to maintain the law. Um, mm. And these poor civilians who haven't got anything to eat um, are suffering from a totalitarian regime who have taken all the supplies underground. And weaponized civilians. Absolutely. Yeah, they told for after October the 7th, Israel did a leaflet drop mm. in North Gaza saying, head south because we're coming. But Hamas said, ignore that instruction. They blocked Which the roads. I think roads. tells you everything that you need to know. They blocked the roads. They, they prevented right. people from leaving. Um, they need people to be in the way of, of, of Israeli munitions, of the Israeli army, because they need um, a, a, a high death toll so that they can rage, wage mm. war um, mm. via the media. But that doesn't change the fact, does it, uh, Emma, that civilians are dying, that people are going through hell. Uh, pressure will grow on Israel to have a ceasefire. Pressure will grow on Israel, at the very least, to ensure that some form of supplies are getting through. Um, I think a ceasefire is unlikely, um, not least because, as I said earlier, a ceasefire takes two sides and Hamas is just not going to offer one. Mm. Um, however much we're calling for a ceasefire, rockets are coming from Gaza mm. towards Israel every day as well as the other direction. Um, 
there's a wonderful piece by Jonathan Friedland in The Guardian, and he says that the problem with this, and certainly the way that we sometimes talk about it in the West, this is not a football match. It's not yeah. about two sides. Yeah. Um, you don't pick your colours. This is two just causes clashing. And we, again, I just come back to making sure for the sake of the Palestinian people and for the sake of the Israeli people that we maintain our humanitarian that we maintain our humanity and empathy. Now, Yosef, I think you're not so sure about what Emma said there. I, I, I believe that the Palestinian cause is a just cause. It's, it's undoubtedly a, a real cause, and people who are advocating for it um, are, are right to do so. Um, however, Hamas has committed unspeakable oh, atrocities. Oh, absolutely. They, I no way want to be seen to be defending Hamas at all. I no, no, I, 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 I don't think that you are, but they've crossed the line and, and even before Israel retaliated, there were people on the streets. Um, there, there was anti-Semitic graffiti, there were shops that were defaced. Mm. Um, and I think there's an idea that given what has happened, given the barbarity and, and the savagery, which, uh, you know, if, if I was to go into some of the details of what happened, oh, they'd, prob they'd, probably cut, oh, it's horrendous. they'd probably cut the feed. So mm -hmm. um, there are times in history, for example, with, with the Nazis, with the genocide in Rwanda, that things are so bad, mm -hmm. things are, are so unspeakable that we draw a line in the sand and we say what happened here must never happen again. And we're not seeing that from... Um, from the international community. Having said that, with regard to, to aid, I, I think the Palestinians should get aid, but we have the privilege of sitting here in a comfy yeah. studio yeah, it's very um, and we, we don't have rockets coming in. Um, so for us to say ceasefire, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, let's have the, the women and children uh, in Red Cross camps uh, inside Israel. I don't mind that. But and I'm also, not, I'm not, I'm not how man. can you have a ceasefire without the release of hostages taken mm -hmm. by Hamas? And that's no, a and really, I really impenetrable problem because they're said to be down in those tunnels now, those tunnels can accommodate 30,000 people. It's not just like a little maze yeah. out there. They can, they can place so many people in those tunnels. Yeah. I mean, I think that we should all take a, a leaf out of the book of... Shokeved Lifshitz. I had to write her name down. You've been practising so. that all day? No, I've been practising it all day because I thought that what that woman did mm. was so remarkable. Yeah. When she turned around oh, and touched absolutely. the hand and said shalom to that... That's that, the humanity I'm talking that, about. It, absolutely. Is it, it, it? Or is it a, a, a confused, abused woman who turned around... Uh, uh, no, I don't think... No, I think that's... Who, I don't Stockholm, think that's Stockholm Syndrome. Absolutely, Stockholm Syndrome. I, I think no. she, she should not have had cameras put in her face. Wait, wait, let, let, let yourself finish. She should have had cameras put in her face after being oh, released. She is over 80 years old. She's yeah. an octogenarian. Um, and I, I, would, I would take that with a pinch of salt. I, I think there is space for humanity. But maybe, but Emma, you're I mean, not I having that two, story. Two points. That. First of all, I believe that she'd been a peace activist That's right. for she all of her, her life. This is who had, she was. And mm. she and her husband had been ferrying um, Palestinians to hospital for years. The uh, other point... She was captured. So yeah. I think still, he's still I'm, captive. He's still a hostage, yeah. I've, because of... Uh, I have one parent who's a pacifist and one who's not, so I've had to make an active choice about what I believe, mm -hmm. and I am not a pacifist. I do believe there is such a thing as a just war, and I do believe that Israel, in this case, has a right to defend itself, but it must do so within international law and, and with the best possible... And I stress possible because I know that possible mm. is not ideal. Mm. Regard for the civilian well, population of Gaza. Well, Do you think that difficult. Hamas are using their international yes, law to are. stop Israel defending herself? Well, actually, absolutely. They, they've got their, their head of operations under one of the main hospitals yeah. in Gaza. Yeah. And that's been known for a very long time. Um, this is what Hamas does. But it, it also needs to be noted that Israel has the unenviable task of conducting war in one of the most densely populated areas in the world. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, the, the civilian casualties, it's, it's terrible and it, it's almost it's Inevitable. unavoidable. Uh, Unavoidable. Yeah, absolutely. Which is Yosef. why I stress the possible rather than the ideal. <laughs> Indeed. Exactly. Uh, Yosef, can I ask you, uh, do you feel, though, uh, and I know that you're a very proud Jewish man, uh, but do you feel that Israel have a case to answer for their treatment of Palestinians over the years? Uh, I have a Jewish friend who's a comedian and a lawyer who describes Gaza as, as the biggest mm. concentration mm. camp in the world. Uh, she's, you know, many people have, have laid 
uh, at the uh, at the door of Israel the accusation that it's an, that Gaza is an apartheid state, uh, and of course the idea that it's an open air prison. How would you address those allegations, those those uh, concerns about Israel's actions over the years? Okay. Well, Gaza cannot be apartheid because there aren't there aren't any Jews in there to be separated. Mm. Um, the, with regard to to the conditions in Gaza, I, I think that Hamas do have something to answer for that. Um, what I will say is that Israel is engaged in an existential war, um, and I will not criticize them in that period. Um, but there has been a policy of no policy with regard to settlements in the West Bank. I'm a passionate believer in a two-state solution. I'm a believer in autonomy for all nations. That's why I voted for Brexit. And peace. Mm, absolutely. But I did speak to a senior military person this week and he described the situation in Gaza as a, pr for years, for decades maybe, as a pressure cooker. Mm. Now that's not to a to take sides or to say that there was apartheid or to say anything else, mm. other than right on your doorstep, you have a pressure cooker waiting to well, explode. The Israeli policy was to contain Hamas in Gaza. And uh, if that's not, you know, a recipe for a pressure cooker, I don't know what is. Every so often they would break out, they would shoot rockets, and, and the, the response would be to, to go in. Um, and that is short term at best. What I'm hoping for now is that through all this unspeakable carnage, there will be a new leadership in Gaza who want peace. Indeed so. Uh, let's have a look now at this very sad news, Linda. Oh. The Sun newspaper, Matthew Perry dead at 54, uh, friend to the end. Uh, Friends was the biggest comedy show of the 90s. And he was... Watched was, by millions. Uh, I was always struck by, um, by him. I remember reading years ago a feature where he talked quite openly about his addiction to alcohol and mm. drugs and opioids. And he said the, the, the reason why he'd at the time managed to kick it, of course he didn't succeed to do that permanently, was he couldn't get over the feeling of waking up sober and how fantastic it was and how much energy he had and he was going to really try hard to make it all work mm. and of course in the end he didn't is he he himself estimates he spent nine million pounds on mm. rehabilitation trying to kick these habits and it's incredibly sad because i remember i was talking to the others before we came on air um covering george best um and did a story for, a big story for tonight with trevor mcdonald he died at the same age 54, 55, mm. George Best Mother, same age, 54, 55. I think when you are addicted to so many toxic substances, particularly alcohol, it just destroys your body mm. and it happens to the most creative people. Indeed so, and he'll be a great loss. I mean, a huge talent gone too soon. Oh, absolutely. Emma. I mean, he's only six years older than I am and mm. it's really hard to emphasise just how important Friends was to my generation. Right. Um, I was hopelessly and, and completely pointlessly in love with my best friend in the second year of university and we had a shared house. And he was never out of my room because that's where the video of season two of Friends was. Right. And we watched it just on repeat. Mm. Um, and I think Chandler Bing changed the way a generation spoke. Mm -hmm. you know, could I be any more uh, emphatic about that point? <laughs> no, definitely right. He was really <laughs> wonderful. A great, great loss. Uh, more from the papers next, plus a brand new segment on the show for Sunday night, The Last Word. Tonight, with Margaret Thatcher's former top advisor, Niall Gardner, live in the studio. Looking forward to this. He's next. We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. <laughs> Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified on playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Tired of the usual focus tested, pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? In your mouth. OK, here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. Join me, Mark Dolan, Fridays and Saturdays from 9, Sundays from 10. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Well, it is National Cat Day, so we've been asking for pictures of your little cheeky kitties, and they are coming in thick and fast. This is Michael's gorgeous felines, Esty and Zila, or Zyla. Aren't they gorgeous? Look at that. Uh, we've got Luke's cat, Bubba. Really cute, looks like a kitten. Marcus's cats, Bowie, Marley, and Bradley, short for Bradley Wiggins. Look at that, forming an orderly queue. Very British cats. Uh, we've got Marie's cat, Cagney and Lacey, crime-fighting duo. David's kitty, Moosey. Oh, look at that little, little face. Look at those eyes. And Keith, Keith's little girl, Lola. Isn't she a sparkler? Wow. That's a really, that's, that's a proper, I don't know, is there an equivalent of crufts for cats? I think she'd win. And Alison's lovely boy, Floyd, in the Amazon box. What a delivery. Uh, great stuff. Look, I loved all your pictures. We've got a surplus of them, but thank you for sending them. Listen, tomorrow's newspaper front page is coming in thick and fast. Let's have a look at the Telegraph now. Hamas blocks exit of foreign citizens. And the day the world lost a friend, Matthew Perry dies at the age of 54. Also, Johnson, Boris Johnson favoured a soft touch over lockdowns, says top scientists. If only he'd had his way. Now, for a brand new segment on Mark Dolan tonight on a Sunday, The Last Word, in which a special guest joins me in the studio to give their final verdict on the weekend that we've had. So, next week sees the King's Speech, the final legislative programme before the next election. It's expected to include laws to bring in tougher sentencing for serious crimes, including rape, and a new annual system for awarding oil and gas licences in a move which reverses some of the government's zero policies on the environment, net zero. And whilst Rishi Sunak has pushed back on extreme political correctness, saying a man is a man and a woman is a woman, is there really enough clear blue water between the Tories and Labour to make a difference in a year's time? If she was still around, what would Margaret Thatcher be advising Rishi Sunak to do? Who better to ask than her former aide and advisor, foreign policy analyst and contributor to the Telegraph newspaper, Niall Gardner. Niall, great to have you in the studio. It's great to be here. Thanks, Mark. Uh, the very first, the inaugural The Last Word on a Sunday night. Now, Keir Starmer has Tony Blair and Peter Mandelson advising him. I think you can see that in some of his policy positions. I feel he's shifted to the centre somewhat. Rishi Sunak sadly doesn't have Mrs Thatcher, but if he did, what would she be telling him? Well, that's a great question. I think the first thing that uh, she would say to Rishi Sunak is that you need to advance Conservative policies in order for Conservatives to vote for the Conservative Party. It's as simple mm. as that. And uh, she used to say that, of course, if, uh, if Conservatives advance socialist policies, 
uh, they're not going to remain in power for much longer. So that was always her, her message, that conservatives have to apply conservative principles. Uh, I think she would be calling for uh, tax cuts, for economic freedom, for a reduction in government spending, uh, a reduction of the size of the state. Uh, there's too much government money flowing around, too much uh, public money. After all, this is taxpayers' money. This is the money of the British people. And so the Conservative government, I think, has to really cut taxes and send money back to the British people. I think that's the first thing. I think, secondly, the issue of immigration. Uh, a Conservative government has to be able to control illegal migration into the country. Mm. It has to be able to make this a very top priority, has to deal with it. Also, you've got to cut the level of legal migration. I think about 600,000 legal migrants came into the UK last year. That's a, a, a city the size of Manchester, basically. Huge numbers. Uh, and the Conservatives have to reduce uh, the inflow of uh, migrants, legal and illegal, uh, coming into uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, I think also, as well, uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher would have been appalled by the, ro by the rise of wokeism mm. uh, in the United Kingdom. And her message to the Prime Minister would have been to, be, to defeat uh, the woke left, to get all the transgender nonsense out of British schools, hospitals, prisons, etc. Uh, and she would also uh, be calling on the Prime Minister to really stand up for British values, for traditional values, uh, and to to really defeat the poisonous, nefarious, woke cultural agenda. Highly, highly destructive. Uh, and I would add on, on to those recommendations as well. Get rid of this awful net zero stuff. Net zero will bankrupt the British economy. It is hugely destructive. It will cost trillions of pounds. Britain can't afford it. Get rid of net zero. It's not a conservative policy. Fascinating. Well, do stay with us now. Let's bring in my top pundits alongside you. Delighted to have uh, Linda, Emma and Yosef with us. Uh, listen, folks, uh, keen to hear what you've got to think. Yosef, is this country still missing Margaret Thatcher? Well, the lady was not for turning, but she would have turned the Conservative Party back to socially conservative values. Um, and she would have, as, as the guest has said, uh, reduced the size of the state and uh, lowered taxes. I, I don't think that we need to resurrect the dead to save the Conservative Party. If we can become um, a radical conservative outlet, uh, entity before the next election, I think there's still hope. Um, I would caveat that by saying that I'm a signed up member of the Conservative Party and I've also put myself on the list to be selected. Um, and I would say that Rishi Sunak's doing a pretty good job considering the circumstances. Uh, we're hearing rumours of an October poll to give the economy a chance to bounce back. Do you think it's already done and dusted, Linda? Uh, no, I think uh, there's still stuff left to play for. I do think the election will probably be um, in the autumn of next year. Mm. But I think that Rishi Sunak, um, I think he's a capable, intelligent guy. And I think the mistake we sometimes make is in thinking we have to have some kind of great orator, someone with great charisma, someone who's always out there in front of the cameras. What we actually need right now is a sensible person running the country mm. who understands what to do in terms of the economy. Uh, listen, Emma, I think it's quite clear from Keir Starmer's stance on a number of issues, including wanting to stop self-ID for trans individuals, that Labour have shifted to the right. And I think it's the hand of Tony Blair and Peter Mandelson uh, bringing Keir Starmer into the centre ground. Look, I mean, on some issues, Keir Starmer has gone to where the country is and um, as a radical feminist advocate for sex-based rights. I'm very happy that the Labour Party shifted position on that particular issue. Um, I think in terms of, um, you know, where Keir Starmer is, I don't think he's influenced much by Margaret Thatcher, which, I would, as a yeah. Labour Party member, I would say is a good thing. Um, but I do think that there is... I mean, if we're still talking about a person who left office when I was 15 as the last great Conservative, Yeah, I think we're talking about a party who's really run out of ideas. OK, well, listen, uh, Niall, last word to you. Uh, your reaction to what we've seen on the streets in London this weekend, anti-Semitic hate, what does it mean for the future of this country? Well, in, in my view, uh, with regard to what we're seeing on the streets, it's absolutely appalling. Uh, we are seeing uh, outright anti-Semitism, hatred, violence, 
a menacing atmosphere on the streets of London. A lot of these pro-Palestine uh, supporters uh, are actually uh, supporting Hamas. Well, there you go. He said it. It was the last word. I'm back tomorrow at nine. Thanks for your company. Good evening, my name's Rachel Ayres and welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast brought to you by the Met Office. So there's been a fair amount of unsettled weather around this weekend and that's due to this large area of low pressure to the west of the UK. This low pressure out in the North Sea has brought plenty of rain to Scotland and northeastern parts of England throughout Sunday. And this will start to clear away to the east as we go through this evening, bringing some patchier rain, though, for a time. Elsewhere, showers will continue, especially along southern and western coasts. But there will be some clear spells, too, and under these we could see the odd patch of mist and fog and maybe a touch of frost across the far northwest of Scotland. Showers will continue through Monday morning, though, especially across Wales and southeast England, where they could be heavy and maybe even with the odd rumble of thunder for a time. Some decent sunny spells, though, especially across Scotland and central and eastern parts of England, where we'll see temperatures rising to 14 to 16. Now, as we go into the start of Tuesday, we'll see a band of showers and rain that will move into Northern Ireland overnight, slowly making its way eastwards. Some drier conditions, though, to the northeast of this. Bit of respite in the southwest as well from those showers before this next system moves in overnight Tuesday and into Wednesday. And that unsettled theme really continues throughout the rest of the week, with Storm Kieran moving through Wednesday night and into Thursday. We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party.